On March 18, 2009, seven fishermen aboard the scallop boat Lady Mary left Cape May for a routine trip to fishing grounds 66 miles into the Atlantic Ocean. Six days later, someone radioed a brief panicked mayday, then nothing. The Lady Mary sank within minutes. What happened at sea that early morning is still unclear. Did a mechanical problem cause a loss of steering, leaving the boat vulnerable to swamping in the rough seas? Or was it a collision with a massive merchant ship that sent the Lady Mary to the bottom of the ocean, killing six of seven on board? The Lady Mary, a 71-foot converted shrimp boat, was owned by Captain Royal Fuzzy Smith, a native of North Carolina. It was Captain Fuzzy who assembled the seven fishermen who often worked together for what would turn out to be the Lady Mary's final voyage. The Lady Mary was the best sea boat, the strongest boat, so I said, well, when everybody need money, hadn't had no money in at least three months, hadn't made no money in at least three months, and everybody looking at me, and watching my hip pocket. So I said, look, all of y'all, let's get on this one boat and go out and get 250 bags and everybody have some money, everybody pay up all the bills, and then we'll go from there. The crew consisted of Fuzzy's two sons, Roy Bobo Smith was the captain, and Timothy Timbo Smith, his first mate. The rest of the crew included Fuzzy's brother, Bernie, his cousin Frankie Creedle, Frank Reyes, Jorge Ramos, and Jose Arias, the only survivor. Was never thinking that anything was going to go wrong, because it was four captains, four experienced. So there was no way, you know, that nothing could have went that could have went wrong. The Lady Mary left the port of Cape May, New Jersey, mid-morning Wednesday, March 18, and headed southeast to the regulated scallop fishing grounds known as the Elephant Trunk. This area happens to be located within traffic lanes that funnel ships from around the world into Delaware Bay and the Port of Philadelphia. These tight lanes can create potentially lethal situations, especially when commercial ships pass through the crowded fishing areas. Uh, everybody I know in this business has had a close call with a ship at one time or another. They're fast moving, they, they take a long time to change course. Uh, we're restricted in our, our, our maneuverability because they're dragging the dredges. And, and you know, it's a, it's a production work, so everybody's busy cutting scallops and, and in five or 10 minutes, a fast moving ship can be on top of you before you know it. There is no one to police where ships can and can't navigate on the high seas. Assessing blame in accidents is often impossible. As one expert put it, there are no skid marks on the ocean. Still, the Atlantic Sea Scallop has hundreds of fishermen seeking riches and taking the risk associated with the industry. Ocean traffic and tough weather don't deter fishermen, especially when they are limited by the government in the number of trips they can take each year. The scallop fishing season usually begins on the first day of March, when the early season weather is often at its worst. It's a back-breaking job. Crewmen sign on for 18-hour staggered shifts, where the work is continuous. Dredges, which are like large metal nets, scour the bottom for scallops. Then the men shuck the meat from the shells while still at sea. The promise of a good payday has scallopers leaving ports from Maryland to Maine. Jersey, New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Newport News, Virginia seem to be the major ports for scallop boats. We make a, we make a pretty good paycheck. It's, if it didn't pay so well, nobody would do it. Cape May Wildwood is the fifth largest seafood port in the United States. Its boats brought in more than $73 million worth of seafood in 2009. The majority of this, $56.6 million is from Atlantic sea scallops, which has overtaken lobster as the most valuable shellfish in the fishing industry. Restricted fishing areas like the elephant trunk are closely monitored by the government to make sure the rich scallop stock is not depleted. If a boat limits out, they can bring in $117,000, and that number can be much higher with larger size scallops. Trips to less restricted areas can earn a boat up to a quarter million dollars, 
a low-level deckhand can pocket as much as $20,000 in a single trip. The crew of the Lady Mary was probably hours away from heading home when the unthinkable occurred. Sometime after midnight on March 24, the boat probably stopped dredging. Based on data from an onshore traffic system, she then drifted at fewer than two knots. Winds were blowing from 25 to 30 miles per hour with seas of six to nine feet. Not perfect for scalloping, but fishermen are used to operating in these conditions. The crew may have been shucking scallops or resting with one of the crew members likely on watch. Shortly after 5 a.m., something sudden and catastrophic happened. Captain Bobo was likely in the wheelhouse. Asleep in the forward bunk room are Jose Arias and Timbo Smith. Frankie Creedle, dressed only in boxers, is probably in the rear bunk room. Bernie and Frank Reyes may have been resting or shucking. Jorge Ramos was off duty, but not in his bed in the forward bunk room. There are conflicting opinions on what sank the Lady Mary, but one fact that is agreed upon is that somehow she took on a massive amount of water and likely went down quickly. A team of experts from Robson Forensics in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, reviewed hundreds of photos, exhibits, and underwater video provided by the Star Ledger to arrive at a probable cause to the sinking. They believe the boat developed a hard list to port, likely caused by either a bow wake from a large vessel in a near miss situation a rogue wave, heavy wind and sea conditions, or flooding in the engine room that the crew was not aware of. It's entirely possible that, that once that list is established, they don't immediately or fully realize that, that this is the beginning of the end now. They're not coming out of the list. Uh, you know, now you're talking about minutes, uh, and certainly not hours. Uh, this kind of impact and the damage that was sustained to the Lady Mary uh, is not consistent with being struck by another vessel. Rather, it's all consistent with a, uh, a significant force as the boat struck a uh, relatively soft, uh, sandy bottom. But not everyone agrees. Another scenario, based on interviews with a marine architect and boat stability expert, professional wreck divers, and the owner of the Lady Mary, who is familiar with the boat's performance, suggests that a collision is what brought her down. The only two vessels within a mile of the Lady Mary were the fishing boat Alexandria Dawn, which was anchored, and the 728-foot Cap Beatrice, steaming through the fishing grounds at nearly 20 knots. They think it was this container ship that ran into the Lady Mary. You picture when that ship coming up just before she hit, she, 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 she putting a wall of water on you. She putting that wall of water on you, and it'll shrunk you to start with. See, and, and like I said, if it hadn't been rough, it wouldn't have happened what happened. The bow wake from the massive ship swamps the rear deck of the fishing vessel, and the water flows into the open door to the cutting room where the crew shucks scallops. Below the water surface, the bulbous bow of the ship contacts the rudder and pushes it into the nut of the propeller puncturing a hole in the rudder and knocking it from its mounting. The bow also strikes the ramp and crushes the port side against the transom. Arias was jolted awake by an impact and the boat listing hard to the port side. Bueno, al impacto, pues yo me At caí impact, de la litera, I fell off the bunk and the other captain, Tim, as well. The boat was already tipped over and taking in water too much. When I got up and went upstairs to put on a suit, but one of the other guys, the Puerto Rican, was standing outside, holding onto the railing. There was a lifesaver. I gave it to him. I said, hold on to this. It's going to help to save you. He was like, petrified, without anything on. Definitely like that. You cannot survive. Tilted in the heavy seas, the boat's starboard outrigger flew up out of the water and its heavy steel stabilizer slammed down onto the deck. Someone screams into the VHF, Mayday, Mayday. A crewman aboard the fishing vessel Good News out of Hampton, Virginia, hears the transmission. They respond with, come back, what's your emergency? There is no reply. 
Arias struggles to get into his survival suit. As the boat begins to sink, he steps into the ocean. The last face he sees is Frank Reyes, still clinging to the railing. He frantically swims away from the Lady Mary as the lights go out. He hears someone calling out at least six times. Then he hears nothing. Arias paddles away, having no idea what caused the catastrophic event. It was a desperation that you feel. I got very desperate to the point where I can almost not put on the suit. And since the boat was on its side, there was no way to balance myself. I was just able to put on the suit, and then that was when the water took me. It happened very fast. I had to throw myself to the water. It had reached me. The Lady Mary went down stern first and came to rest on the ocean bottom, 211 feet below the surface. When she sinks, her emergency radio beacon, called an EPIRB, automatically sends a signal to a NOAA computer in Maryland. Embedded in the signal is a 15-digit code that identifies the boat as the Lady Mary. But because of a clerical error, a C that was thought to be a zero, the computer does not recognize the signal's owner. At 7.55 a.m., a lower satellite finally verifies the location of the EPIRB signal, and the Coast Guard is notified. Nearly 90 minutes have passed since the Lady Mary sank. The Coast Guard later determined that the single misread digit and the subsequent delay may have cost at least two lives. The rescue helicopter and its crew of four come upon a life raft at 8.20 a.m. Arias is nearby and is rescued. Oh, I felt a great joy. I waved to them so that they would come back and help me. I was clinging to the board. The bodies of Timbo and Bobo Smith are recovered from the water. Their survival suits are on, but not completely zipped. They had both drowned in the freezing Atlantic. Jose Arias is the only survivor. Four fishermen from the Lady Mary still remain missing at sea. The big story on Action News tonight is the latest on the tragedy at sea off the coast of New Jersey. A fishing boat sank in rough seas early this morning, and at least two people have now died. It's a tragedy at sea. A fishing boat sinks off the Jersey coast. Two crew members are dead, and the search now continues for four other men who are missing in that frigid ocean. And I called him, Dad, they said a boat went down. Uh, you know what's going on. I'm trying to find out now, and now my heart's sinking. Because if he don't know, then that means it's a possibility. I made a phone call to Karina's mother, and she told me it was Roy who had died. And then I didn't know how I was going to tell my kids. I run straight to my room, change my clothes, and get on my bed and start praying. And I cry, and I'm just like, God, please let this just be a mis mix up. Please let that come home. My world just stopped. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Arias was taken to Atlantic Care Regional Medical Center in Atlantic City and the bodies of Fuzzy's two sons to Shore Memorial Hospital in Summers Point. At that point in my mind, I'm thinking, do I want this to be him or do I want him to be lost? And I said, I would rather that it be him there than for him to be lost and never know or never find him. When they opened the door, the first person I saw was my brother-in-law, uh, Bobo, and I was thinking, oh God. The coroner was in the way. When he, stepped, when he stepped aside, then I saw that it was Tim. And I remember his lips being blue, so I took, you know, it was like, it was probably from the cold. But he looked asleep, both of them. They didn't have any marks on them, no sign of any kind of stress or anything like that. It, he just looked asleep. And I remember kissing him and just telling him how much I loved him. And that I, I couldn't wait to see him again. When, when I heard that what had happened, I 
I don't remember really praying for nothing. In my whole life, except that day, I asked the Lord to let them two boys be my boys. And it was. So I said, I won't ask for nothing else. Because I, I got that prayer answer for one reason or another. Nine days later, the NOAA vessel Thomas Jefferson locates the wreck using sonar. The U.S. Coast Guard granted permission for a professional dive crew aboard the Big Mac out of Cape May to be the first to explore the wreck. It was 50 days after the incident. When they dove the Lady Mary, they found the body of Bernie Smith, Fuzzy's brother, in a fish hold below deck. When they saw the damage to the stern of the boat, they began thinking that a vessel collision may have been what brought down the Lady Mary. Uh, the, the facts are that the, the damage to uh, Lady Mary was basically all in the stern, um, between the rudder being broken off and uh, the ramp pushed down, five-inch uh, stainless steel shaft to the uh, propeller bent down. Um, some of the blades were damaged as well. The team at Robson says the damage to the boat occurred when it hit the ocean bottom. But a number of other experts say that this isn't possible. They also believe there's a smoking gun. Two stay wires, or cables, that attach the ramp to the gallows were broken free. One encased in a steel sleeve was hastily tied back with a rope. Some think that the collision caused the cables to break free, and the one on the port side was quickly tied out of the way by a crewman. If the damage happened because of the hit on the ocean bottom, then how did the wire get tied back? That really established that the accident happened on the surface uh, versus hitting the bottom. Uh, obviously, nobody would tie it in 210 feet of water. The Coast Guard really has to account for how did that stern damage occur. But I, you know, I, I, I personally just can't, can't fathom how that damage could have come from impact on the bottom. I've never seen a vessel look that bad from striking the bottom. While current Coast Guard officials wouldn't go on camera with the Star Ledger, fishing boat stability expert and ex-Coast Guard officer Bruce Belosovsky agrees with the divers. It had to be something very, very dramatic to be able to sink that vessel without giving those guys a decent amount of warning ahead of time. That, that's, that's very, very localized, high-stress impact. You know, we had a collision. We had the hull ruptured, which allowed the vessel to take on water. Water has a free surface effect. If you get a list to one side, the water starts going to that way. It doesn't come back. It keeps going. I think the evidence uh, strongly suggests a collision with another vessel. Data from an automatic identification system, or AIS, puts the container ship Cap Beatrice within three quarters of a mile of the Lady Mary at the time of the incident. But it's not absolutely accurate because the land-based system doesn't account for tides and current. I think there's a very good chance that the Camp Beatrice was the culprit in this case. Uh, we don't have sufficient evidence to prove it. It was the closest vessel that we know of in the area at the time. This is what a container ship looks like from a quarter of a mile away at night. This is the view forward from the bridge of the Cap Beatrice. The bow of the ship is well over 500 feet away in low light, poor weather conditions, and a full load of containers piled five or six stories high, it is conceivable that they hit the boat and never even knew it. Neither the ship's captain nor its owner would agree to an interview for this story. The Coast Guard inspected the Cap Beatrice for damage at the Port of Philadelphia and said it found no evidence of a collision. But that was two months after the fact, and the ship had already traveled to Australia and back. Lead Coast Guard investigator Kyle McAvoy has provided some information on the direction of the investigation, but has refused to comment in detail. Two sources say the Coast Guard has dismissed the collision theory in favor of the boat swamping. Since casualty records began, dozens of fishermen have died in collisions with large merchant ships. 
no one has ever gone to jail. No one has even been prosecuted. As long as there is a valuable fishery and consumers willing to pay the market price, there will always be boats heading out to sea looking to cash in, regardless of the danger. In 2009, 11 fishermen lost their lives in New Jersey, making it one of the deadliest years on record. Tragic loss of life at sea is never easy to accept, and the pain and suffering on land continues for hundreds of family members and friends who must learn to live with the void left behind. I just want to spend the rest of my life in there. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I just know that we will be all right eventually. I don't know. I don't know. Arias remains haunted by the memory of the event that took the lives of the many worked beside on the Lady Mary. He rarely comes near the dock and has no intention of working at sea ever again. No, 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 ya no más. Not anymore, because one of the promises when I was floating in the ocean, I asked my creator if I came out of this with life, never again would I go back to the work of the ocean. Two months after the accident, a scalper working near where the Lady Mary sank pulled up the body of Frankie Cradle in its dredge. The bodies of Frank Reyes and Jorge Ramos were never found. As for Captain Fuzzy, he owns three rusting fishing boats that haven't seen open ocean since the tragedy. Having lost so much, he has decided not to continue fishing. Bobo and Timbo and the ashes of their uncle Bernie are all buried in his private backyard cemetery in North Carolina. Having his sons and brother close provides him some sense of peace. I was surprised when I, when I talked to Corino, and she said, Dad, take him, take him down home, and both of them could be together. For a while there, I thought I was going to lose my mind. But so far, I'm, I'm hanging in here, and I look at Fuzzy, so I try to be strong for him, because it's eating him up inside. I can tell how hard it is for him, because he's lost the three that always was by his side that helped him do everything. So now he's got it by himself. Sometimes I hate to see the sun come up. So then I, then I got to get out and move around. It, 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 I, don't, I, I don't know where, where I could live with them being out there. But it'll get better. It'll get better.